Friends. Reptiles. Fictional characters? I don't know. Inside of you there are two wolves. One wolf has planned out all of your projects into the middle of next year, and the other wolf saw a thing on the internet and wants it immediately. <sighs> Guess we're making a leaf dress. The leaves were going to need some kind of base, so I decided to start with my Tudor kirtle pattern. I made some light modifications, nothing fancy, slightly different neckline, thinner straps, and assumed it would turn out fine. It won't. It won't be fine. Note that hubris for later. Anyway, not yet knowing my mistake, I cut out the four bodice pieces from a cotton fabric for the lining, and then this loosely woven twill wool mix. Then, because I've made this exact dress like five times now, I tried a different method of making up the bodice, which I learned from McCall's pattern instructions. Sew the bodice pieces together at the centre back and shoulders, leaving the side seams open. Then with the lining and outer right sides together, you sew around the front and neckline, and the arm side, still leaving the side seams open. The next step, once pressed and clipped, is to turn the whole thing inside out by pulling the fronts through the shoulder strap, and this is the moment when I realised... I screwed up. This fabric was way too bulky to go through the much narrower shoulder straps I'd picked for this specific project. There's just no way it'll fit. I should have kept the original straps or chosen a different construction method. Nevertheless, I would persevere at this impossible task for a frankly embarrassing length of time. I tried everything, rolling the fronts into little sausages, using a poking stick, pliers, you name it. Eventually, though, even I gave up and abandoned my horrible mutant creation in favour of more extreme measures. So once you've turned the bodice right side out, ignore those straps, we'll fix them in post. You open up the side seams and line them up, outer to outer and lining to lining, and so Concentrate on getting the middle seams lined up for the cleanest result. You can always fix the edges, but the alignment in the middle will be really annoying if it doesn't match. Now you have a completed bodice, it's time to do finishing. Pressing, whip stitching back together any seams you might have ripped out in a fit of malice, and finishing the bottom edge with some bias binding. Because this is a wool mix fabric, I'm not going to be throwing it in the washing machine, so I used some silk binding binding I had left over from another project. This fabric also frays a lot and thus everything is a mess. And just like that, the kirtle's done. I keep turning to this pattern because I've made so many of them, the fit is basically spot on. I love the way they look and I've done it that many times, I can easily pick where I want to do something a bit different and where I can follow the exact same construction I did last time and just coast along on muscle memory. I didn't film making or attaching the skirt because honestly it's the easiest thing in the world and there will be a proper kirtle video at some point. It's just rectangles and cartridge pleats. I always finish the bottom edges of the kirtle bodices because I like cartridge pleating and I find it's just easier that way. I also went with hook and eye tape for closures since I didn't fancy trying to make eyelets in this fabric. It's so loose and bulky I think I would have struggled. The only other thing I did a bit different was to use a deep hem facing of the same lining fabric. I've been dreaming about those lovely sonde floor dresses with the contrast hem facings and I thought this fabric would benefit from a nice deep stable hem that wasn't too bulky. I ended up just top stitching the top because it's quite a long skirt and not super visible. So this, I believe, is a Skindapsis pictus. I have three Skindapsis, but this is the one with the biggest leaves, so obviously it's my favourite. Obviously the most notable thing about this plant is that it's incredibly silvery. There's a lot of complexity in the design on these leaves that I don't think I'm going to be able to replicate, but hey, we can do an artist's impression. I have some greyish green fabric that I thought would work pretty well for the Skindapsis. I folded the fabric into three so I could trace and cut multiple leaves at the same time, and then I used the plant as a reference guide to to sketch out the leaf shape in Sharpie. Once I was happy with the outline, I can cut that out. With this one, I'm painting in the darker sections of the leaf, so using the actual leaf as a reference again, I used a watered down mix of acrylic paint to fill in the areas of darker colour.
Repeat this across two more leaves and move to a cat-free location to dry. So this here is obviously the main event. This is my Monstera. We've had our ups and downs. It's been a it's been a tough time. She's very in the way. Hang on, that's not better. Yeah, no, this is this is worse. As you can see, she's got a new leaf coming through. This is the most recent new leaf. I'm very proud because she has four fenestrations and as you can see from the lower ones, you might not be able to see from the lower ones at this angle. We had a good run of no fenestrations at all, so we're getting there. We're working through it. I also have, uh, hang on. Yeah, we're down at floor level. So I also have not one, but two on Stara Albo. My first one I grew from a single leaf cutting. It is pushed out its second new leaf, which has this much variegation on it we might have a falling out. And then this was my other Monstera. So I got a bonus at work and so I, I'm gonna buy myself a Monstera Albo. I paid 60 pounds for a four leaf plant and it went missing in the post. And they offered to replace it, but they were like, the only one we've got left is not great. This is, this is my not great Monstera Albo. And so it's down here underneath my big Monstera, which I love because I'm ashamed of it and it has only bad memories. It is putting out a new leaf too. So maybe we'll be friends now. I don't, I don't know. Seems unlikely. With the Monstera Deliciosa, the fenestrations, those cutouts and the leaves, are really the star of the show. So I started by tracing out a generic leaf shape on fabric that was folded into four layers. My plant was a bit big to carry into the workroom, so I used pictures off the internet as a reference instead. I ended up separating this into two pairs so I could have two slightly different fenestration patterns. Small form Deliciosa usually has larger fenestrations further apart, whereas the large form, or Borsigiana, which is actually still a Deliciosa but I digress, tends to have many narrow fenestrations. I decided to make two of the four Monstera leaves albo, or with white variegation. The first one I tried very standard, big, white, organic looking patches, and it turned out okay, not amazing. With the second I tried for more of a Thai constellation variegation pattern of lots of small speckles and that was somehow way worse. I think the spots were too far apart maybe? Either way it definitely didn't translate well into a more simplified abstract design and I should probably have stuck to big white spots like a dairy cow. This I don't know what this is. I've been assuming it's like a pothos, but I I have no idea. It was a single leaf cutting that I got from a plant swap. And as you can see, it has put out many new leaves and no one, no one can tell me what it is. So if you know what it is, please let me know. Cause I'm telling you now, I don't think this is a golden pothos, which is what everyone says. I have a golden pothos and it don't look like that. So I have a couple of different kinds of peperomia. I've obviously got the regular one and I've got a, a watermelon peperomia. This is a raindrop peperomia or a peperomia polybotria. Polybotria. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And currently this one is my favorite, not only because look at the size of these leaves, but it flowered. This is what, it thinks a flower looks like. It's kind of rubbish and I love it and so that's why it is being immortalized. Not gonna lie, I picked this one for two reasons. One, Peperomia are great and everyone should have one and two, the leaves were really easy. Basically just one color and thus this would be very little work. Getting the shape right was the most important part, but it's the same process as the previous two. Use the plant itself as a reference, draw in Sharpie on fabric folded into four, cut out. The leaves on the real plant have a little discoloration where the stem attaches, and so I thought I might as well put a little bit of effort into these as a treat, but otherwise they were quick and easy. The 
this is going to be tricky. So this, this is a Calathea network, or at least it was when I bought it. Did you know taxonomy changes all the time? Because it does. I love this plant. It has some of the most interesting leaves I've ever seen. Also, occasionally my partner forgets what it's called and calls it the William Gibson plant, which I love. I got two different colours of fabric for this project and the Calathea network needs the light colour one. I think you know the process by now, use reference images, sketch in Sharpie, cut out, briefly marvel at just how weird the shape of these leaves are, google the new classification and wonder whether you should even bother trying to pronounce Gopertia Kegeljani. Because this design is all fine lines, I decided I would just use green sharpie to draw in the very detailed pattern. I started with the midrib and drawing in lots of close together radial veins before settling in to crosshatch many times across every single space. I've actually left this clip in full, sped up to 10 times its original speed, so you can all live vicariously through just how much time it took to draw in these bloody leaves. It's a good thing I like you, William Gibson Plant. So this is one of my Marantas. So I have two Maranta. This is a Maranta Fascinator, which has the red coloration. This one, I don't think I've had super long, but it's making its own leaves. The common name for these plants is prayer plant because they lift their leaves up at night and then they lower them down like this during the day so that they can photosynthesize, which I think is very cool. The Maranta have some of the most complicated leaves, so I had to figure out in my head how I thought they would work, and definitely the first one was pretty ropey. But I could at least bring the plant into the room as reference. For the Fascinator, I blocked in the dark section on either side of the midrib first before moving on to the red veins. On this one I think I did too many veins and I didn't curve them towards the leaf tip enough. It took until leaf 2 to get my hand in on that one. Then with the other variety of Maranta which I didn't film for some reason, which is a Cachoviana or rabbit's foot. I started with the green veins, you can see how much curvier these veins are than the previous leaf. They're not perfect, but I was getting better. And then it just has these dark smudgy spots on either side, which should be much darker than the veins, but I was really bored of mixing paint. Hello! This is my dining room table, where I put all the plants I don't have places to live yet. I don't have a problem. There's a lot of good leaves here, but what we're going to particularly look at are the Syngoniums. This is a pink Syngonium. They exist. This one is quite new to me, but I'm really enjoying it. It's got like a white blush to it in the same way the other one has a pink blush. I don't know what kind of Syngonium it was. I got it from Plant Swap. And then this was a rooted Syngonium Albo cutting that I got. And I'm really looking forward to when this starts pushing out more leaves because it's got some good variegation. I don't know if you know, plants that have white spots on them, if they don't have enough light, those spots just turn brown. That's a thing. When you see these beautiful Monstera Albos with these full moon leaves, they just die. They just die so fast. And yet everyone wants them. But anyway, I love Syngonium because they're basically weeds and they just grow. The first thing to get right was the Syngonium's very distinctive leaf shape, but honestly, you've all seen this process by now, you know what I'm doing. I was done with trying to do lots of leaves the same, and there's loads of Syngonium varieties, so I started off attempting the white blush version I have. I don't know if I quite managed to convey that particular plant, but it certainly looks like a Syngonium. Thank you. 
Then I had a go at, I can't remember if it's called a Pixie or a Holly Syngonium, it's something like that. Honestly, only slightly different from the previous one. And then I tried my hand at a Syngonium Albo, and this one did not really work. I think maybe because I used the light coloured fabric and Syngonium Albo are a really deep dark green. Either way, once I'd painted in the white patches, I wasn't happy. So I had a go at making it a, I think the variety is called Three Kings, where it's a mix of white and different greens. I'm still not sure I did a great job. This one was kind of abandoned rather than finished. I almost forgot to film this one. This right here is my favourite houseplant. This is the Aspidistra. Oh no. Oh, it's because we've had the fire on. Okay, yeah. The Aspidistra, or cast iron plant, was the Victorian's favourite houseplant. If I ever had a second YouTube channel, it would be about the history of different houseplants. And the first houseplant I would talk about is the Aspidistra, because it's perfect in every single way. Don't water it, it doesn't care. Put it in a dark place, it doesn't care. Set fire to it slightly. It doesn't care. This is the best and most perfect houseplant that has ever been made. It is borderline unkillable, and if you look after it, it will thrive. Truly, we are blessed by its presence. The other great thing about the Aspidistra elatior is that the leaves are really simple. So now I have an enormous pile of leaves, a box of safety pins, and nobody to stop me. In Rachel Maxey's video that inspired this project, she went for a real, like, woodland fairy vibe. And so my goal here was very houseplant fairy. You know, will encourage new leaves if you watered everything correctly. Makes your calathea leaves curl up if they're not happy with you. Look, I had a lot of time to think about this. Just this step took a couple hours. I went red wig because I thought Rachel Maxey, right? But I actually think I look more like a budget Florence in the machine. Anyway, final thoughts. This was weird. This this was a weird, weird project. Things I liked. I like that I made the base layer something that I can rewear and probably will rewear a lot. I have made, God, how many have I made now? I've made like six of these Tudor kirtles now. And so the pattern is pretty much where I want it to be. So the fit's pretty good. I quite like it. This is actually, I'm glad I got to test drive the more Elizabethan shaping, so that's going to become real relevant quite soon. 
I hope. The leaves, individually and on the table, pretty good. Quite liked them. On the dress, not so much. A lot of the inconsistencies that I got in like the painting and the colours and that don't really matter so much when they're all together, but equally when they're all together it's very very busy and I think the individual details really get lost. Maybe smaller leaves, more spaced out would have been better, I don't know. The Monstera leaves are kind of a disaster, I mean this is one of them. That doesn't look right, that doesn't look good. I should probably have like stiffened them, but I think I'm only going to use the leaves as is for this project and like this half an hour of filming. Which brings me on to like the big thing I'm not happy about which is that uh, I spent an extremely long time painting leaves. That was in hindsight not such a good idea. I'm definitely trying to transition to making more stuff that is going to be reusable as opposed to just for a single event whether that's a video or a LARP game and all these painted leaves were not that. Do you know what I'm going to do with the next? I've got a plan for a project. Use them for something else but not in their current leaf-like form. More on that probably in the new year. Something I super have been struggling with is keeping up with everything. <laughs> So I have a real full-time job, I have YouTube, I'm also trying to get stuff I can put on Instagram and other social media platforms, and I have to keep the house running and take care of my cat. Things add up really quickly, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed about YouTube is at the moment I'm not really getting to go to LARP games for health reasons. I actually don't know when that's going to change, which is extremely frustrating because I was hoping to be done by now. YouTube has really given me the opportunity to to still keep making stuff, experimenting and coming up with fun character ideas and costume ideas and, and implementing that. And that's great as long as it's still fun and definitely by the time I was halfway through all of these leaves it stopped being fun. I guess if the final reveal was a little underwhelming that's that's why. I stopped caring about this like a week and a half ago. But that's okay, spotted this was going on early enough that I can not keep making those mistakes so I have a Christmas project planned. We'll see how long that takes me to make. I'm gonna try and get it done before Christmas but if it doesn't work out then it doesn't work out. I'll talk about this more in the video on that project but I have deliberately changed up what I was doing to make it something I was more excited about because right now I don't have the energy to make things that I am only moderately interested in having. I am super super glad that the main two pieces of this costume are things that I will be able to wear again either for costumes or just in day-to-day -day life. I no longer care about going out in public wearing my LARP kit for like normal events. I don't know man, after lockdown I don't care who thinks I'm weird anymore. I just want to be cozy. I've tried really hard to stick to one video every two weeks because so there's two reasons. One is that YouTube loves regularity and the other reason is that the more content you put out the more chance you have of something getting picked up by the algorithm, going viral and getting shown to a lot of people and so much of success in YouTube is just luck. It's just about hitting the right zeitgeist moment. Knowing how the algorithm works and that it's not anything personal and that it is kind of luck has really helped me like keep focused and keep engaged when videos that I thought would be more popular weren't. You can read and watch hours and hours of content on how to go viral on YouTube and you can do all the right things and it still might just not work because nobody knows what the computer is thinking. We taught sand to think and some people feel that was a mistake. Not in this household. This is solidly a house that is 100% the robots should think we would welcome that. We are a pro robot rights household. 100% the computers should be thinking for themselves. But unfortunately at the level that they are currently thinking for themselves it doesn't always work out great for little channels so which isn't to say that the channel's been doing badly. Thinking back to when I started like this kind of success was impossible to imagine. It's one thing to like fantasize about having a million subscribers and it's another thing to be like hey there's like two and a half thousand people who look at your stuff and think it's cool. That's a long and rambling way of saying that if I'm going to keep doing this I have to make sure that I'm doing stuff that I actually really enjoy, not just that I think we'll do well on the algorithm because no one knows what will do well on the algorithm. That's not sustainable. So Christmas project should be fun, very silly, but also something I'm quite excited about. Should I say a historical era I'm quite excited about. I've got reasonably serious plans for the new year, some of which will be more thrifting and field kit wardrobe stuff, content that doesn't do particularly well but I think it's useful so I'd rather it was out there. Some big projects 
spread across the year, but they will be spread across the year. Maybe one or two new things on the channel, which I've been percolating for a little while and I think will be good. And I think I'd like to give them a go. And I hope you all stick around to find out about it. This has got silly and overly long and kind of personal. So let's just cut to the chase. Down in the description box, you will find links. You can follow me on Instagram. You mainly get cat pictures. You can follow me on Kofi. It costs money, but you get early access to my videos. And if you want to help convince the robots that my channel is worth watching, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you'd like to stick around. And now to use the sign off that I entirely stole from the last Olympics. Dream big and I'll see you next time.